Hey, hey there, Sioux High AP Biology students. Yep, this is Mr. McLeod again. Welcome to the next summer assignment podcast dealing with chapter 53 in our textbook. Again, just a reminder that all the work in the summer assignment package is due the day we return to school on September 2nd. So make sure you're doing a minimum of two chapters a month so you don't try and cram it all in at the end of August. Okay, chapter 50 introduced some basic ecological concepts. 51 was on animal behavior. 52 introduced population ecology. And in chapter 53, we'll look more specifically at the ecology of populations. So get your notes out, something to write with, and let's populate. Wow, that, that sounded a bit strange, hey? Now population ecology is the study of populations in relations to environment, including environmental influence on, influences on density and distribution, age structure, and population size. Now, recall that a population is a group of individuals of a single species living in the same general area. Now, if you don't have that in your notes, it'd be a good time to put it in there now. Now, population density is the number of individuals per unit area or volume. So get that in your notes. And then finally, population dispersion is the pattern of spacing among individuals within the boundaries of a population. Also get that down. Now the population density or how many people live in a specific area is the result of an interplay between processes that add individuals to a population and those that remove individuals from that population. A couple of most likely review concepts are emigration and immigration. Immigration is the influx of new individuals from other areas, while emigration is the movement of individuals out of a population. Now make sure you get that down. In this picture, you see this goose now leaving this group or emigrating from this group and flying in or immigrating to this group over here in population two. So leaving is emigration, arriving is immigration. So make sure you know the difference between those two. Okay, now let's look at some patterns of dispersion. Most of these patterns are influenced by environmental and social factors. Get that down in your notes. Now there are three types of dispersion. So let's also get these in your notes. And you can see them here, clumped, random, and uniform. Now clumping is most common. Individuals aggregate in patches and may be influenced by resource availability and behavior. So get that in your notes. So you see a picture of clumping right here. You actually see an artist's rendition of clumping as well. Now, down here, let's look at uniform. Uniform is one in which individuals are evenly distributed and may be influenced by social interactions such as territoriality. So get that down in your notes. So uniformity or uniform pattern of distribution. Now last over here is random. Random is the position of each individual is independent of other individuals. And it occurs in the absence of strong attractions or repulsions. So get that in your notes as random. I can assure you that some of the AP Biology exam is very similar to the science portion of the ACT. So you're going to see a lot of charts and graphs. So kind of get used to it. Now let's talk about demography. Demography. Demography is the study of the vital statistics of a population and how they change over time. Write that down. 
Now, demographers are interested in birth and death rates. You can see that here. A life table is an age-specific summary of the survival patterns of a population and is best made by following the fate of a co cohort or a group of individuals of the same age. Write that down. There's the, you see a life table here, which is an age-specific summary of the survival pattern of a population and follows the fate of a cohort, which is a group of individuals of the same age. Now, the life table in this picture of Belding's ground squirrels reveals many things about this population. Now, when we graph that life table, we get what's called a survivorship curve. Now, a survivorship curve is a graphic way of representing the data in a life table. Now, the survivorship curve for Belding's ground squirrels shows a relatively constant death rate. Of course, the males, you can see, don't live as long as the females. I don't know how we got gypped like that, but that's the way it works in most populations. Huh. Now, survivorship curves can be classified into three general types. Let's get them in your notes. And they're listed here by pictorially. Now, look at type 1 right up here in the upper right. Type 1, low death rates during early and middle life, and then an increase among older age groups. Get that down. That's the first kind of survivorship curve. Type 1. Now, let's look at type 2, you see here in the middle. Type 2 is where the death rate is constant over the organism's lifespan. And you can see that by that line shape. Then there's type 3. Type 3 survivorship curve has a high death rate for the young than a slower death rate for survivors. So make sure you get those descriptions down in your notes. Now for species with sexual reproduction, demographers often concentrate on the females in a population. Now you see here a reproductive table or fertility schedule. Now, what this is, is an age-specific summary of the reproductive rates in a population. Write that down. So a reproductive table or a ferti fertility schedule is an age-specific summary of the reproductive rates in a population. And what it describes is the reproductive patterns of a population. So also get that down. Now, let's talk about an organism's life history. An organism's life history comprises the traits that affect its schedule of reproduction and survival and involves the following. So get these in your notes. The age at which reproduction begins is a factor. How often the organism reproduces is a factor and how many offspring are produced during each re reproductive cycle is the third factor in the life history. Now, life history traits are evolutionary outcomes reflected in the development, physiology, and behavior of an organism. Also write that down. Now, as you can see here, life histories are very diverse. Species that ex exhibit semel parity, and you see semel parity down here in the bottom left, also called Big Bang reproduction. So we're going to talk a little bit about semel parity or Big Bang reprodu reproduction. Those organisms reproduce once and die, while species that, I, that exhibit, exhibit 
iteroparity, sorry about that, iteroparity, or repeated reproduction, produce offspring repeatedly. Write that down. So what you need to know is the difference between semoparity and iteroparity. In semoparity, uh, organisms reproduce once and then die, and then in iteroparity, they continually reproduce. Now, high variable or unpredictable environments likely favor Big Bang reproduction. That's semoparity. While dependable environments may favor repeated production, iteroparity. Write that down in your notes as well. Now, organisms, especially wild organisms, have finite resources which may lead to trade-offs between survival and reproduction. Write that down. In animals, parental care of smaller broods may facilitate survival of offspring like you see here in this picture. Having a larger brood means a lower survival rate for both, both males and females. So while it would seem like a larger brood would bode well for the brood itself, it's harder on the parents. So again, there's an optimum brood size. A uh, brood is just the number of offspring um, that you can see here in this graph. As the brood size increases, the likelihood that the parents die also increases. Now in another example, some plants produce a large number of small seeds, ensuring that at least some of them will grow and eventually reproduce. That's, you see a little dandelion up here. While other types of plants produce a moderate number of large seeds that provide a large store of energy that will help seedlings become established, like you see down here. Write those down in your notes. Now it's useful to study population growth in an idealized situation. Let's talk about what an idealized situation is. Idealized situations help us understand the capacity of species to increase and the conditions that may facilitate its growth. Write that down. Now remember, not all environments, in fact most, are not ideal. Now first of all, if immigration and emigration are ignored, for example, certainly not in a normal situation, but in an idealized one, a population's growth rate equals birth rate minus death rate. So get that down. So growth rate equals birth rate minus death rate. Write that down. So then zero population growth occurs when the birth rate equals the death rate. Also get that down. Now, let's talk about exponential population growth. Now, exponential population growth is population increase under these idealized conditions. Now, under these conditions, the rate of reproduction is at its maximum, and that's called the intrinsic rate of increase. Yep, write that down. So, intr intrinsic rate of increase is the rate of reproduction at its maximum. Now this produces the J-shaped curve you see right here. The J-shaped curve of exponential growth characterizes some rebounding populations. Get that in your notes. So if you ever see a population graph that looks like this, this is a population on the rebound. A good example would be if a fire wipes out a forest eventually those plants and undergrowth are going to start growing back and when they do their populations are going to look like this at the beginning. Now as you might imagine exponential growth cannot be sustained for long in any population. Therefore a more realistic population model limits growth 
by incorporating something called the carrying capacity, which you should be familiar with. Get this graph in your notes, then let's discuss its parts. Now, carrying capacity, or K, is the maximum population size the environment can support. And you see that right here. So it's the maximum population size the environment can support. So write that down. Now, in the logistic population growth, not exponential now, we're talking about logistic population growth model, the rate of increase declines as carrying capacity is reached. Also get that down. So now you can see here in this graph that here's your J-shaped curve right here. This is your exponential growth and right next to it now is your logistic growth. So at carrying capacity, for example, a 40-acre woodlot can only hold so many animals because it only has so much space, so much water, so much food, etc. And when those resources start to run out, the population begins to level out. And that's what you see here in this logistic curve. Now, the logistic model produces a sigmoid or an S-shaped curve. You've got to get that down as well because you need to know the difference between the J-shaped or exponential growth curve and the S-shaped or logistic growth curve. So make sure you get this graph down and you know the difference between the two. Now the growth of laboratory populations of paramecium fits an S-shaped curve. These organisms are grown in a constant environment, lacking predators and competitors. So what happens now is you get this explosion of population now that looks like it's going to be an exponential curve, but eventually what happens is, for example, if we're growing them on an auger plate, the resources start to run out. The nutrients start to run out, and when they do, the population levels off right here, and we would call this the carrying capacity. And if I ask you what the carrying capacity would be, you'd just follow this line straight over here, and you'd say some, somewhere around 850 or 900 in there. Okay, let's move on. Okay, let's, look, let's move on to life history traits. Life history traits favored by natural selection may vary with population density and environmental conditions. Get that in your notes. Now ecologists break organisms down into two categories based on this selection method. So I'd like you to get this graph in your notes and then let's talk about it. So go ahead and do that now. Okay, now K selection or density dependent selection selects for a life history traits that are sensitive to population density. Get that in your notes. Now, also write that in density independent pop or density dependent populations, birth rates fall and death rates rise with population density. So get that in your notes as well. Now, our selection, or density independent selection, selects for life history traits that maximize reproduction. Write that down. Now, also write that in density independent populations, birth rate and death rate do not change with population density. So write that down. Now, density-dependent birth and death rates are an example of negative feedback that regulates population growth. Write that down. Now, the density-dependent birth and death rates are affected by many factors, such as competition for resources, 
territoriality, disease, predation, etc. Now in crowded populations, increasing population density intensifies competition for resources and results in a lower birth rate. Yep, get that in your notes. Okay, now a word about territoriality. In many vertebrates and some invertebrates, competition for territory may limit density. So get that down. For example, cheetahs, not cheaters, cheetahs are highly territorial, using chemical communication to warn other cheetahs of their boundaries, while oceanic birds exhibit territoriality in nesting behavior. Again, you'll need to know some examples for territoriality. So if you need to jot those down as examples, do it. Now, let's list the other factors we mentioned to get a brief description in your notes. Population density can influence the health and survival of organisms. For example, in dense populations, pathogens can spread more rapidly. Get that down. Now, predation. As a prey population builds up, predators may feed preferentially on that species. So that would damage that particular species. Also write that down. Now, toxic waste. Accumulation of toxic waste can contribute to density-dependent regulation of a population size. For example, when, the, when DDT was introduced in the environment way back in the 60s and 70s, the eagle population was decimated. So that's a great example of how toxic waste can affect now um, a specific species. Now last is intrinsic factors. For some populations, intrinsic, also known as physiological factors, appear to regulate population size and an example would be the age of reproductive maturity. So get that in your notes as well. Okay, the study of population dynamics focuses on the complex interaction between biotic and abiotic factors that cause variation in population size. Write that down. Long-term population studies have challenged the hypothesis that populations of large mammals are relatively stable over time. For example, weather can affect population size over time. Changes in predation pressure can drive population fluctuations, but no population can grow indefinitely and humans are no exception. Even though the global population is still growing, the rate of growth began to slow during the 1960s. Now in order to maintain population stability, a regional human population can exist in one of two configurations. Let's get these in your notes. We've mentioned them already. One is zero population growth. Now zero population growth is equal to high birth rate minus high death rate. Or zero population growth can be low birth rate minus low death rate. Now this all contributes to what's called demographic transition. This is the move from the first state toward the second state. In other words, from high birth rate minus high death rate to low birth rate minus low death rate. Get that in your notes. Now demographic transition is associated with an increase in the quality of health care and improved access to education, especially for women. Most of the current global population growth is concentrated in developing countries. Now the reason we mention this is because what we apply to populations of any other animal like deer or uh, elephants or whatever also applies to human populations. Now one important demographic factor in present and future growth trends 
is a country's age structure. Write that down. Age structure is the relative number of individuals at each age. Also get that down. Now age structure diagrams like you see here can predict a population's growth trend. They can illuminate social conditions and help us plan for the future. Okay, last concept now in this podcast is called the ecological footprint. Now this concept summarizes the aggregate land and water area needed to sustain the people of a nation and is one measure of how close we are to the carrying capacity of the earth. Get that down. Now countries vary greatly in footprint size and available ecological capacity. The carrying capacity of the earth is uncertain at best. The average estimate is around 10 to 15 billion. Now our carrying capacity could potentially be limited by food, space, non-renewable resources, or buildup of waste. Write those four things down. Okay, that finishes the Chapter 53 podcast on populations. Make sure to take a picture of your notes and then submit, the, submit them to Moodle for credit. All right, talk to you soon.